this is the 11th lecture <coughs> on DSP and our topic today is we continue our discussion on discrete Fourier transform and then we also introduce the Z transforms today. In the last lecture, we had started with the spectrum of a given signal by DFT, the signal being given from 0 to capital N minus 1, but you want a spectrum at a dense set of frequencies. So, what you do is you pad P A D or add A D D the required number of zeros, so that the total length becomes from capital N it becomes capital M, where capital M may be much larger than capital N, then you compute the DFT. We also discussed the properties of DFT, linearity, then circular shift which I illustrated with a circle diagram, that is a very easy thing to do and <coughs> the other properties were modulation and Percival's relation. The computation of circular convolution is extremely important because it is an aid to calculating linear convolution. Most of the time you shall have to calculate linear convolution that is response of a given system to a given input and that is linear convolution. Circular convolution is a contrived technique because it helps in finding linear convolution by FFT and that is the only use of circular convolution. We discussed several methods of circular convolution, graphical method, then the mechanization in the form of a table and multiplication and addition. We also discussed how to calculate circular convolution from DFT, you multiply the two DFTs and take the IDFT. This can be done from the summation or from the matrix. The matrix happens to be easier sometimes, not most, not all the time. How to calculate linear convolution if the two sequences have different lengths? Then you first find out what the length of the linear convolution shall be. It would be capital N plus capital M minus 1 then you add zeros to both the sequences and then calculate the circular convolution that will give you linear convolution. There is yet another method for calculating circular convolution and that is by taking help of what is known as the circulant matrix which is a reflection <coughs> of circular shift. You recall that if I have to calculate y of n which is g of n circularly convolved at capital N number of points with h of n, then the required relationship is summation g of m h of n minus m, m going from 0 to capital N minus 1. All right. Now, if I expand this relationship for a few samples of the output, suppose I take y of 0, <coughs> then n should be put equal to 0 and h of n minus m should be taken with mod n. So, my first sample becomes g 0, h 0, m equal to 0. <coughs> The next sample becomes G 1, then H of minus 1 which will be H of N minus 1 plus G 2, H of N minus 2 and so on up to G of N minus 1, H of H of 1, agreed? small n becomes capital N minus 1, sorry small m becomes capital N minus 1 and therefore it is h of 1. Similarly, 
if I calculate y of 1 then it would be g 0 multiplied by h of 1 plus g 1 multiplied by h of 0 plus g 2 h of n minus 1 plus etc plus g of n minus 1 what will come here h of 2 agreed and we can continue this. <coughs> Notice that the <coughs> excuse me Notice that the sum of the two indices 0 plus 1 is 1, n minus 1 plus 2 is how much? n plus 1 which is the same as 1, agreed? This is to be noticed. Now if I write this in matrix form then you see what I shall get y0, y1 up to y of n minus 1. I am trying to express this in terms of in terms of g0, g1 up to g of n minus 1. If I write the coefficients for y of 0, I start with h of 0 and the next sample is h of n minus 1 the last sample is h of 1. So, <coughs> I get h 0, h of n minus 1, h of n minus 2 up to h of 1. In the next sample, I start with h of 1. So, h of 1 comes here it is as if it is a reflection of circular shift. It is as if h of 1 comes here and displaces h of 0 to the right. So, I get h of 0, h of n minus 1. What would be the last sample? h of 2 and this continues. The last one what would be the n minus 1 and then I shall have h of n minus 2 and this goes on, what will be the last sample? H0. H0. <coughs> so, if you can write, if you can write this, this is in the in the sequence H0, H1, Hn minus 1 first column and first row, then you can write the whole of the matrix and you see that the main diagonal has all H0s. The, the matrix is a very interesting matrix and it is called a circulant matrix because samples simply circulate. Okay? This is one shift and then this one, the one that you have thrown out comes here. Another shift, the two samples that you have thrown out, they come here. So, it is a circulant. Once you are able to write this matrix, then it is simply matrix, then it is simply multiplication and addition. So, this is yet another method for calculating the circular circular convolution. <coughs> Whatever uh, procedure appears attractive to you, adopt that. <coughs> Suppose we have two sequences g of n and h of n, each of length capital N n equal to 0 to capital N minus 1 and we wish to calculate g k and h k. We wish to calculate both of them. Normally, it shall require two n point DFTs, but then if we combine the two signals analytically, that is we put one signal at quadrature with the previous signal. In other words, if we calculate if we form a new sequence which is g of n plus j times h of n quadrature means 
multiplying by j. This and this j h of n are at 90 degrees to each other. In other words, we are making this signal intentionally complex. Then we can find out the end point DFT of x of n because both are end points. All right, so x of n is also of length capital N, and we calculate capital X of k. Then from there, we shall have to calculate calculate g of k and h of k. Now you notice that g of n is nothing but x of n plus x star of n. Take the complex conjugate and divide by 2. Similarly, h of n is equal to x of n minus x star of n divided by 2j. And therefore, if we calculate capital X of k, if we calculate capital X of k and the DFT of x star of n, then we can find out capital G of k and capital H of k. So, all that requires to be found out now is capital X of k. By definition, capital X of k is equal to summation x of n w n raised to the power k n where n goes from 0 to capital N minus 1. Then let us see what is the DFT of x star of n that is what we require. By definition this is I will omit the summation limits x star of n would be x star of n multiplied by w n raised to the power n k. All right. I am finding out the DFT of this. So, the sequence multiplied at w n to the power n k. This I can write as summation x of n w n raised to the power minus n k the whole thing starred. Agreed? Now, what is this? What is this summation? This summation is simply x of minus k because all that changes from here to here is the sign of k. But whenever you use minus k, you must use modulo n and there is a star here. So, x star of minus k. Agreed? And therefore, capital G of k is simply x of k plus x star of minus k modulo n divided by 2 and h of k is equal to 1 over 2 j x k minus x star of minus k modulo n. So, we have saved computations. We are calculating only capital N number of points DFT. By, cal by computing one FFT, we are calculating the DFT of both G of K and H of K. But all that glitters is not gold. There is something hidden here. The effort is slightly more than computing the DFT of a real sequence. Is not that right? Every, in the first step, when you compute x of n w n to the power k n, it is no longer two multiplications, it is four multiplications because x of n has become complex and <coughs> that is the price to be paid. But even then, the number of computations required is less, much less than in computing two capital N point DFTs. This you must realize that we have made this sequence a complex one. So, every multiplication now becomes four real multiplications. We take an example, the same two sequences g of n <coughs> equals to 1, 2, 0, 1 and h of n is equal to 2, 2, 1, 1 where the arrow indicates n equal to 0. All right. 
<coughs> so we form an x of n which is g of n plus j times h of n. So the, sig sig the samples are 1 plus j2, 2 plus j2, then 1, no j and 1 plus j. <coughs> and the simplest way to calculate this in this instance is to use the matrix W4. We have already shown that it is equal to minus j, agreed? And therefore, capital X of k is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. First, write the first row and the first column, which you can very easily write. And then we start with W4 to the 1, so minus j, square of this is minus 1, the multiplication of this is plus j, W4 to the 3, then W4 square comes here, minus 1, square of this is plus 1, and the multiplication of the 2 is minus 1, all right. Then what comes here? J, W and cubed, which you have already calculated j then j squared is minus 1 and the last sample is minus j multiplied by the new sequence which is 1 plus j2 then 2 plus j2 then j and 1 plus j. This is the new sequence x of n and now it is simply <coughs> multiplication and addition and the result that I get is 4 plus j6, 2, minus 2 and j2. Please do verify whether my answers are correct or not. And once we know x of k, we can find out x star of k. It is simply the complex conjugate of this. So it would be 4 minus j6, 2 gives 2 minus 2 gives 2 and j2 gives minus 2. The next step is calculating x star of minus k. <coughs> x star of minus k is equal to x star of 4 minus k modulo 4. All right. And there is an interchange of signals. First, when k is 0, 4 minus j6, then minus j2, next minus 2 and then 2. Okay. So, you can calculate gk and hk by adding these two, adding x of k with x of x star of minus k subtracting x star of minus k from x k and dividing by 2 j shall give you h k and the results are if I am right 4 1 minus j minus 2 1 plus j this is g k and h k is 6 1 minus j 0 1 plus j that is the completion of the example. <coughs> Can this be used? Can this trick be used if the lengths of the two signals are not the same? Suppose g of n is of length n and h of n is of length capital M. Can you use the same trick? You must pad zeros so that the length of g of n becomes n plus m minus 1. Similarly, h of n becomes n minus 1 and the number of points for DFT calculation will now be m plus n minus 1. So, you have to calculate 1 m plus n minus 1 point DFT. Whether this is more laborious 
then calculating two DFTs that is N point DFT and M point DFT shall depend on what capital N and capital M are all right. So, one must be careful in blindly using FFT you might just be wasting time. It may be more prudent to calculate two DFTs one end point one M point rather than combining them, but sometimes combining them helps. And that leads us to an introduction to Z transforms. <coughs> In the continuous time domain, continuous time signals, we have Fourier transform and we encounter some difficulties. The difficulty is Fourier transform for a continuous time signal is on the J omega axis, all right, J omega axis and there are signals for which the Fourier transform does not exist. For those signals what we do is instead of e to the j omega t we also introduce we also introduce a convergence factor e to the minus sigma t. So that the resulting signal x t e to the minus sigma t converges. In other words the Fourier transform shall exist for an appropriately chosen value of sigma. Okay? So, e to the minus sigma t is a convergence factor and this gives rise to Laplace transform. Laplace transform is in terms of the variable s that is any point in the s plane. So, from, from a one track mind we are now diversifying we are covering the complete S plane. Z transform has an has the same kind of interpretation that is there are sequences X of N for which the Fourier transform does not exist. So, what we do is instead of multiplying by e to the minus J omega N we also introduce a convergence factor R to the power minus N. All right, where r has to be properly chosen so that x of n r to the minus n has a Fourier transform and this transform is now you see the Fourier transform we compute on if this is the z plane real part z j imaginary part of z then Fourier transform we compute on the unit circle the radius is 1 and omega varies in Fourier transform only omega is the variable we are assuming that we are computing in a complex plane but we are confining ourselves to the unit circle. If we remove this restriction now that is if we want to go to the general z plane then what we do is we take x of n r e to the j omega whole to the power minus n all right this is the same as r to the minus n e to the minus j omega n. So, I have introduced a new variable which can now encompass the total z plane because small r can vary in Fourier transform small r was restricted to be equal to 1 in z transform small r can take any value and therefore, if we introduce this symbol z for small r e to the minus e to the plus j omega then this is my capital X of z. So, the formal definition is capital X of z is equal to summation n equals minus infinity to plus infinity in general X of n z to the minus n agreed this is the generalization of the Fourier transform for the discrete time domain exactly similar to Laplace transform in continuous time domain. But the properties are quite uh, different they are not very similar. 
small z as you realize is a continuous variable, is a continuous complex variable. It has a magnitude r and an angle omega, all right. Now <coughs> you also notice that capital X of z is equal to summation X of n r to the minus n e to the minus j n omega. So, it is also it can also be looked at as the Fourier transform of the sequence X of n r to the minus n. And naturally the question of existence comes does it exist or does it not exist? Obviously, one of the sufficient conditions would be that this new sequence the given sequence is x of n you have artificially introduced a convergence factor r to the minus n you have to see whether that converges or not. Obviously, a sufficient condition would be that x of n r to the minus n is absolutely summable or square summable. If it is neither absolutely summable nor square summable you cannot definitely say whether z transform exists or not all right because both absolute summability and square summability are sufficient conditions they are not necessary and sufficient conditions. This also complicates matters because Fourier transform we are only concerned with one track a circle of radius 1. Now we are expanding into the total z domain total complex frequency domain and therefore we shall have to consider the question of existence in terms of what is known as ROC that is the region of convergence. If the sequence does not converge anywhere in the z plane which sequence x of n z to the minus n summation if this summation does not converge anywhere in the z plane then we say z transform does not exist ok. Let us see <coughs> the other conclusion that we can draw is that if the region of convergence please follow it carefully if the region of convergence of a z transform includes the unit circle if a region of convergence an arbitrary region of convergence if it includes the unit circle then the Fourier transform shall also exist. Is that clear? <coughs> the region of convergence is the region where the Z transform exists. If it includes the unit circle then its Fourier transform shall also exist. The vice versa is not true. Fourier transform may exist but the z transform may not exist. Another way of writing this is capital X of e to the j omega equal to capital X of z with magnitude z equal to 1 provided you must add provided the ROC if ROC includes includes mod z equal to 1. Mod z equal to 1 is the unit circle in the z plane. We take an example. <coughs> Before we take the example um, let me just make a statement and I shall illustrate it later that if g of z which is the z transform of z of n exists then the region of convergence in general is an annular region which is bounded by two circles two circles of radius r r and radius r l 
okay in general the region of convergence lies between two circles of radii r r and r l the significance of the subscripts shall be clear a little later but if it exists it exists in an annular region where obviously it will exist if r r is less than r l isn't that right if this radius is less than r l then only it will exist not otherwise r l can extend up to infinity r l may be infinity r r can be as small as the origin zero we shall find examples in which our r l will go to infinity or r r will go to zero or it can be the region between infinity and zero let's take some examples to illustrate this fact if the sequence is one sided then either left or right yes we will we'll take we'll take examples we'll take examples one sided sequence two sided sequences causal sequences anti causal sequences and so on and so forth first let's take the <coughs> the simplest example x of n equal to delta n what is capital x of z x of n multiplied by z to the minus n but it exists for n equal to 0 only so it is 1 in other words the z transform of delta n exists at all values of z in other words r r is equal to 0 r l is equal to infinity the total z plane okay if on the other hand x of n is u of n then capital x of z is simply summation z to the minus n n equal to 0 to infinity because the sequence starts at n equal to 0 and this is a geometric progression and the sum is 1 minus z inverse provided z inverse is restricted to be less than 1 otherwise you cannot sum it, sum it up the magnitude of z inverse should be less than 1 that is magnitude of z should be greater than 1 which means that the region of convergence in the z plane is outside the unit circle the total region outside the unit circle in other words capital r subscript small r is equal to 1 here and rl is infinity okay this is my u of n <coughs> if we take an alpha to the power n un instead of 1 un alpha to the power n un in a similar manner you can show that the summation the series will converge alpha to the n z to the minus n which is the summation n equal to 0 to infinity summation n equal to 0 to infinity alpha z inverse to the power n this would be this would converge to 1 minus alpha z inverse provided alpha z inverse magnitude less than 1 that is magnitude z greater than magnitude alpha so instead of the unit circle we have to take a circle of radius magnitude alpha only then the z transform exist in a similar manner i can find out the fourier the z transform of r to the n cosine of n omega 0 what we do is we write cosine n omega 0 as e to the power j n omega 0 plus e to the minus j n omega 0 whole divided by 2 then each of these terms is of the form alpha to the n u n all right and the z transform if if you combine the two terms it would be 1 minus r cosine omega 0 z inverse divided by 1 minus twice r cosine omega 0 z inverse plus 
r squared z to the minus 2. This is what you get provided mod z yes mod z should be greater than 1 agreed mod z should be greater than I made a mistake ah that is correct mod z should be greater than r I can convert 1 into an r very easily ok is that clear mod z should be because there is an r to the n and r to the r e to the power j plus minus j omega 0 magnitude is simply equal to magnitude of r and therefore mod z greater than alpha here it should be mod z greater than mod r ok not mod r r is a real quantity so r similarly you can find out the z transform of r to the n sin of n omega 0 and the z transform is r sin omega 0 z inverse divided by 1 minus the same denominator twice r cosine omega 0 z inverse plus r squared z to the minus 2. <coughs> and once you know these transforms that is delta n u of n alpha to the n u n cosine n omega 0 r to the n I, I have made a mistake again nobody pointed it out pardon me I have made a mistake here this must be u of n because I applied this formula al alpha to the n u n therefore there must be u n the sequence starts from n equal to 0 this is a causal sequence this is a right sided causal sequence Similarly, in the other one sign I must include a u of n otherwise it is not valid ok. Now, let us look at <coughs> in general therefore, if g of n has a z transform capital G of z then capital G of z from these few examples you realize that it would be a rational function it would be a ratio of polynomials what is a rational function a rational function is a ratio of polynomials what is a rational number it is a ratio of integers agreed pi is not a rational number but one third is a rational number although it cannot be truncated I mean it cannot it is an infinite duration number 0 0.3333 ad infinitum but it is a rational number. What is a polynomial? What is a polynomial? I said g z should be of the form p z over q z ratio of two polynomials. What is a polynomial? Polynomial is a finite series finite series e to the z is not a polynomial because it is infinite sin theta is not a polynomial ok. So, it is a finite polynomial having only integral <coughs> positive powers of the variable 1 plus x plus x squared is a polynomial, but 1 plus x inverse plus x to the minus 2 is not a polynomial in x, but it is a polynomial in z inverse agreed. So, in general our g of z although we write as p z by q z shall be a ratio of polynomials in z inverse and we can write this ratio let us write it we can take out a constant in general and this is a discipline that we shall follow the constant terms in both the numerator and denominator shall be 1 ok this is how I achieve it by taking out a constant 1 plus let us say p 1 z inverse plus p 2 z to the minus 2 plus let us say p m z to the minus m and the denominator 1 plus q 1 z inverse plus etcetera p 
plus q n z to the minus n where m and n may be different m can be greater than n m can be less than n or m can be equal to n we will we'll consider the most general case but if you have a polynomial of degree capital m in z inverse then the fundamental theorem of algebra says that it must have capital m number of factors okay let us denote these factors g of z as k what will be the form of these factors because the constant term is 1 1 minus let us say xi l z inverse where l goes from 1 to capital M the numerator is a polynomial of degree capital M so it must have M number of linear factors each factor shall be of this form because we have contrived to make the constant term equal to unity. Similarly in the denominator I can write this as a continued product L equal to 1 to n 1 minus what symbol did I use lambda L z inverse ok. Xi L and lambda L well I can also write it in this form k multiplied by z to the power suppose I take z inverse out from each of these factors then I can write z power capital N minus M multiplied by summation z minus xi L agreed is that ok yes. I take z inverse out how many times capital N times that is why z to the minus n comes which in the numerator it becomes z to the plus n. Similarly from the numerator I take z to the minus m out then in the denominator I get z minus lambda l where l equal to 1 to n l equal to 1 to m. <coughs> At this value xi l the function becomes 0 so xi l are called zeros and at these values of z lambda l the function blows up it becomes infinite so lambda l are called the poles zeros and poles. It appears that the function has capital M number of zeros and capital N number of poles but then something is hidden here if N is greater than M if n is greater than m then I shall have capital N minus m zeros at the origin. Similarly capital N minus m zeros at z equal to 0. On the other hand if capital N is less than m then I shall have so many poles at z equal to 0 agreed in general in general for any rational function the number of poles must be equal to the number of zeros including the points at origin and infinity ok. These are zeros and poles excluding the point z equal to 0 agree. On the other hand if capital N is equal to M then we have no problem same number of poles and same number of zeros nothing at the origin nothing at infinity. <coughs> now we come to finite and infinite sequences let us see how the poles and zeros differ. If the sequence is finite for example we take a sequence 1 2 and 1 this is n equal to 0 if this is the sequence <coughs> x of n then what is its z transform it would be first term would give z right n equal to minus 1 n equal to 0 would give 2 and n equal to 1 would give z inverse and therefore for a finite sequence 
we may have a pole at the origin due to z inverse and a pole at infinity agreed for a finite sequence z equal to 0 is a pole z equal to infinity is also a pole if the sequence starts from a value of n which is negative. On the other hand if we have a causal sequence causal finite sequence then no term with powers of z shall appear with positive powers of z shall appear agreed and therefore the poles shall be only at the origin. Now <coughs> a finite sequence ok I will come to this. Uh, let us see how this is one pole at infinity one pole at 0 ok let us take specific cases. Suppose we have an RSS a right sided sequence starting at n equal to 0 right sided sequence starting at n equal to 0. What do you call this sequence? Causal. Then its Z transform shall contain only negative powers of z and therefore the poles all poles shall be at z equal to 0 agreed all poles shall be at z equal to 0 therefore the roc roc cannot include a pole why not because at pole the function blows up it diverges so the ROC of this sequence shall be mod z greater than 0 right. In other words R L agreed or R R R R is equal to 0 and R L equal to infinity ok. The total z plane excluding the point at the origin. Let us take a left sided sequence. <coughs> so, why not to write r, r is equal to 0 plus? 0 and 0 plus have the same significance here. We do not distinguish unless you are you account for a delta function. In a delta function, 0 plus and 0 minus you have to distinguish. But the point at the origin have to be excluded for a causal sequence. On the other hand, if you have an anti causal sequence that is an left sided sequence starting at n equal to 0, then all poles shall be at infinity, all poles at z equal to infinity, which means that the ROC shall be mod z less than infinity the total z plane except the infinite circle ok. On the other hand the example that we took it had started at n equal to minus 1 0 and plus 1 it had started from the left it is a right sided sequence starting at a point to the left of n equal to 0 and there both origin and infinity had to be excluded. So, the ROC for the z transform of this is mod z less than infinity and mod z greater than 0. So, it is the total z plane except the infinite circle and the point at the origin. In a similar manner if you have a left sided sequence starting at well this is a left sided this can also be considered as a left sided sequence starting at n equal to plus 1. So, for an for a sequence which is neither causal nor anti causal both the points at infinity and origin are excluded from the ROC ok. 
given a situation you can always on the other hand if you have an infinite sequence infinite sequence you see in the case of a finite sequence our z transform was a polynomial in z inverse or a polynomial in z or a combination of the two agreed for a finite sequence if it is if it is not causal neither is it anti causal then we have a polynomial we have sum of two polynomials one is in z inverse for the right sided part for the causal part and one in z for the anti causal part ok. So, our ROC was between infinity and 0. For an infinite sequence the z transform is a rational function p of z divided by q of z it is no longer a sum of two polynomials. Well, you can consider this still as sum of two series not polynomials sum of two infinite series that is where the distinction between series and polynomial lies. A polynomial is a finite series whereas for an infinite sequence either causal or anti causal or combination of the two the the z transform is still sum of two series but both of them are infinite ok. So, infinite series in general you can write in a finite form as a ratio of polynomials p z by q z ok. And obviously if you locate the poles this is the unit circle if you locate the poles in the z plane real part z and j imaginary part z then the ROC a million dollar statement ROC is bounded by the poles bounded by the poles ok. The poles the circle on which a pole is located cannot be part of ROC is the point clear. If you have let us say a circle here a pole here then obviously the ROC cannot include this pole it must be either outside or inside agreed ROC is bounded by poles we take examples. <coughs> u of n the z transform was 1 minus z inverse and where is the pole? Pole is at z equal to plus 1 this is the pole. So, what was the, what is the ROC? From other considerations we found out that the ROC is mod z greater than 1 because at 1 lies the pole. Similarly, if we have alpha to the n u n agreed then the region of convergence is mod z greater than mod alpha and alpha is the location of the pole all right. Both of these are right sided sequences and in general right sided or causal causal ok we make it special causal sequences causal in finite length sequences have an ROC outside a circle which circle the highest pole the farthest pole from the origin it is bounded by that outside that is the ROC. For example let us take another example we have an H of n 0.2 to the power n plus minus 0.6 to the power n u n. It is a causal sequence sum of two sequences ok. 
one sequence is 0.2 to the n and the other is point minus 0 0.6 to the n and the z transform is 1 minus 0.2 z inverse plus 1 by 1 plus 0.6 z inverse. The ROC of this of this term only is mod z greater than 0.2 and the ROC of this is mod z greater than 0. Why is it less than 0. 0.6? <laughs> magnitude of this, magnitude of alpha, so magnitude of minus 0. 0.6 is 0. 0.6. Let us draw a picture to remove the confusion. If we, if we simplify the given expression, I have done it and the result is z 2z plus 0.4, z minus 0.2, z plus 0.6. If we write as ratio of polynomials in z, where are the poles? One is at plus 0.2, another is at minus 0.6, minus 0.6 and there is a 0 at the origin, there is also a 0 at minus 0.2, so minus 0.2. We indicate zeros by circles and poles by crosses, okay. Then the ROC has to be outside this circle. What is the radius of this circle? 0 0.6, not minus 0 0.6, okay, the magnitude of them and therefore, the the ROC of the combination is outside points. It cannot be inside because if it is inside then it includes the pole at point 2. So, it is bounded by a circle passing through the farthest pole all right. Causal sequences have a Z transform whose ROC is bounded by a circle passing through the farthest pole and <coughs> I will just take another example to see if there exist sequences which do not have a Z transform. This sequence for example unless you add a U of n or U of minus n it does not have a Z transform because your capital X sub Z can be written as summation alpha n Z to the minus n, n equal to 0 to infinity plus I shall indicate that another term n equal to minus infinity to n equal to minus 1 alpha n Z to the minus n agreed. This summation shall exist for mod z greater than mod alpha whereas this summation shall exist for mod z less than mod alpha. You can say that mod z equal to alpha is an overlap, but mod z equal to alpha passes through the pole and therefore, no ROC no Z transform. In Z transform the region of convergence is an extremely important attribute, important characteristic and a, and a Z transform if the region of convergence is not given is not a one to one, not underlined is not a one to one transformation. This does not happen in Fourier transform. We do not have to specify a region of convergence. What is the region of convergence of a Fourier transform? The unit circle. Agreed? The unit circle. It is on the unit circle. Therefore, there is no other region. But for a Z transform, the convergence shall occur in general for an annular region. Annular region could be bounded by as small a radius as 0 and as large a radius as infinity, yes. 
I think this is where we should close today.